Carter's overalls and hard hats sprinted past the Russians, blocking Carter's line of sight, and the Russians dived behind the armoured wagons before he could get a bead on them. The workers hurried on towards the nearest motors as the battle continued raging around them. The Russians kept firing unaimed shots at the vehicles. One of the workers screamed as a stray bullet caught him in the leg. The other man turned to help his stricken friend and took a couple of rounds to the chest, flopping to the ground beside a clapped-out Skoda. Carter thought, Three enemies behind the vehicles, two behind the maintenance sheds. We're winning. The last defenders were putting up a hard fight, popping out of cover to shoot at the wagons before shrinking from view again. Round slapped into the ground half a meter to Carter's left. Logan slid another grenade into the launcher. Popov and McVeigh were targeting the surviving Russians with short bursts. Webb had his sniper rifle trained on the sheds, ready to put holes in the enemy as soon as Logan flushed them out with the RPG. Carter cupped his hands and shouted to his colleagues, Cover me! I need covering fire! Logan looked round at him. Where are you going? To find the general. He couldn't wait for the lads to finish off the remaining soldiers. The general would have heard the shooting at the front of the plant. Carter figured there was a good chance Koltrov might have fled as soon as the bullets started flying. No more time. I've got to move now. He paused beside the wheel, waited for Logan to switch to his M4 and bring up his weapon. Then they started putting down rounds on the few remaining defenders, working in pairs. Logan and McVeigh fired first, keeping the Russians pinned down behind cover. Once they had emptied their mags, Webb and Popov would take over, maintaining a consistent rate of fire. Between them, they would stop the Russians from taking pot shots at Carter while he was exposed. As soon as Logan and McVeigh started letting rip, Carter sprang out from behind the Suburban and broke into a sprint, chopping his stride as he made for the shipping container-shaped building 200 metres away at his 11 o'clock. Running across the vacant car park as fast as his weary legs could carry him, a cry went up to the north as the Russians spotted Carter and started directing sporadic bursts of gunfire at him, the cracks of their AK-74s splitting the air. He heard the dull thwack of rounds splashing against the tarmac. Another bullet whip-cracked past him. They were getting closer, he realised. Then the M4s barked in reply as Logan, McVeigh and the others kept up their furious rate of suppressive fire. Carter ran on, willed his body to move faster. Keep going. Don't lose now. You've come too far. He pushed on, past the stolen suburban, and reached the single-story building in another three ragged strides, stopped outside and looked cautiously round. There was nothing to indicate the building's purpose, just a windowless structure with reinforced metal walls and a half-open door at one end of it. Harsh light spilled through the slender gap. From within, the mechanical hum of generators reached Carter's ears. No sign of the general or Zinchenko. Carter raised his M4 and stepped towards the door, eased it open, plunged inside. Chapter 23 He swept through the door into a long and narrow space brightly lit beneath the glare of a string of overhead fluorescent tube lights. A steel gangway ran down the length of the main room, past a bank of diesel generators, each one set on a raised metal bed. Carter counted twelve of them, arranged in a long line. At the far end of the walkway, beyond the last generator, there was a separate smaller room housing some sort of big electrical units, fuses and circuit breakers. It was furnace hot in the room. A deafening motorized thrum filled the air, AC generators whirring away, accompanied by the noise of the generators working to keep the plant operational. Backup power systems, Carter reminded himself, designed to keep Holovika operating safely until the electrical grid could be restored. Above the mechanical hum, he heard another sound, a thick, grating voice speaking in Russian. General Koltrov. The voice came from the smaller room. A terrible feeling swelled up in Carter. 
He moved cautiously down the walkway, clearing the space between each generator. The sound of his boots on the metallic surface drowned out by the machine noise reverberating throughout the building. As he neared the smaller room, the general's voice became clearer. Koltrov sounded like he was projecting his voice, like a politician addressing a crowd of devoted fans at a campaign rally. From outside the building came a rumbling boom as Logan unleashed another RPG at the enemy. The firefight would be over soon, Carter knew. The last few Russians would either surrender or make a run for it once they realized the game was up. Another two or three minutes and we'll have regained control of the plant. He stopped again at the threshold, pricked his ears. Koltrov was still talking in his booming voice. With his flimsy grasp of Russian, Carter could only pick up on the occasional word or phrase. The general name-checked the Russian president. He spoke of victory and enemies and total sacrifice. Carter pushed through the opening, sweeping his weapon sights from side to side in a broad arc. There were several colossal metal-cased units lined up on the left side of the room, each one housing an array of buttons and dials and control panels, like something out of a server farm or a prototype computer laboratory in the 1950s. Emergency switchgear equipment, he supposed, for supplying juice to critical power plant systems in the event of an unexpected loss of power, such as when Russian artillery shells knocked out the electrical power supply. In the middle of the room, no more than four or five paces away, was General Koltrov. Zinchenko stood in front of the general, filming him on her smartphone. Koltrov was addressing himself directly to the press officer's handset, delivering a thunderous speech in Russian as he pointed accusingly at the lens. Koltrov stopped talking as soon as Carter entered the room. He spun round, started to reach for his belt-holstered pistol. Then he caught sight of the M4, trained at the broad mass of his chest, and stopped. Very slowly, Zinchenko lowered her phone. General Koltrov stared at the SAS soldier. His cheeks were burning with rage and indignation. You, he spat. How did you? But it doesn't matter. It is done. He smiled, but there was an eerie calmness in Koltrov's expression that unnerved Carter. I am ready. Ready for what? Carter growled. Koltrov sidestepped the question. He said with a sneer, You shouldn't have followed me here. This is not your fight. It never was. But you will pay now with your life. All of you will pay. The fuck does that mean? The Russians are afraid to do what is necessary to win. They do not understand that if we wish to defeat the fascists, we must be prepared to take the ultimate step, make the ultimate sacrifice. Only then can we secure total victory over the West. Others are afraid of the consequences, but I am not. I am willing to do what must be done to destroy our enemies, even if it costs my life. The general darted a glance towards the rear of the room, which was when Carter noticed the device. There was an emergency exit door a few paces behind Zinchenko. Beside it, resting on the floor, was a cylindrical unit, no bigger than a piece of carry-on luggage, sheathed inside a foam-insulated canvas carry case. The lid had been removed. There was a mechanical timer on the exposed top of the aluminium drum, along with several switches and dials. Carter stared at it, felt his guts turn to ice. He was looking at a bomb. Specifically, a low-yield, man-portable, tactical nuclear weapon. At least, Carter assumed it was a tactical nuke. It looked similar to the ones he'd seen in Tajikistan, and he'd heard rumours that the Russians had been covertly transferring hundreds of such devices to secure locations across occupied Ukraine. The smallest ones had a yield somewhere in the region of a kiloton, equivalent to a thousand tons of TNT, a fraction of the destructive force of Hiroshima, say, but capable of obliterating a strategic target such as a dam or a bridge, or destroy a nuclear power plant. He kept staring at the bomb. 
He recalled Makarenko's dying words, right before Carter had blown his brains out. You're all dead, all of you. Now he understood. In a few minutes, that bomb will detonate. Koltrov puffed out his chest in a show of pride and defiance. I shall die with honor. I will be remembered as a hero of Greater Russia, the man who brought the West to its knees, and I shall take you all down with me. Carter swiftly grasped the general's plan. Once detonated, the man-portable bomb would destroy the backup generators and the rest of the plant's critical infrastructure, cutting the power to the cooling systems and causing the reactors to overheat, triggering a catastrophic nuclear meltdown. The resultant explosion would disperse vast clouds of radioactive material. Prevailing winds would push them across much of eastern and northern Europe, exposing the Baltic states, Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, Austria, NATO member countries, to potentially fatal levels of radiation. The fallout would be devastating, untold casualties. It would make Chernobyl look like a minor fuck-up. Moreover, he realized grimly, the Alliance would be compelled to react to a deliberate attack. Carter cast his mind back to the report he'd seen on the news several days earlier. He remembered the veiled threat from the US Secretary of State to punish Russia if it crossed the nuclear red lines. Swift and firm retaliation, the Secretary had vowed, the likes of which the world will not have seen before. Which could mean any number of things but at the very least, it would provoke a strong military response. The US might obliterate the Black Sea fleet, or start actively targeting assets inside Russia. Escalation would be unavoidable. World War III. Nuclear annihilation. Outside, the shooting had reduced to sporadic bursts of gunfire, and Carter knew that the fight for the plant must almost be over. Right now, McVeigh, Webb, Popov and Logan would be going through the remaining enemies like a dose of salts, the regiment way, oblivious to the imminent threat of nuclear Armageddon. Carter kept his weapon pointed at Koltrov. Disarm it, he said. Koltrov smiled, but said nothing. Carter felt the muscles on his neck cording like tensed ropes. Disarm the bomb, or you're fucking dead. I cannot. The firing device has been activated. Too late. Bullshit. Koltrov gave a nasty laugh. You think I am bluffing? Idiot. Whatever I do, I am a dead man. Moscow will not forgive me, not after this. They would leave me to perish in some camp in Siberia. There is no dignity in that death. Here, at least, I can die as a martyr. He laughed. Carter felt the pressure building inside his skull. The pounding was relentless now, incessant. You lose, English. Koltrov glanced meaningfully at the press officer. Something unspoken passed between the general and Zinchenko. Then Koltrov uttered a command at her in Russian. A single word. Carter understood it at once. Run. Zinchenko spun round and ran towards the emergency exit. Carter automatically swung his rifle towards her. A momentary distraction. Instinctive. But it took Carter's attention away from Koltrov for a split second. Which was a mistake. Because then he glimpsed a fleeting movement at the fringes of his vision as the general ripped his Glock pistol from his side holster and brought it up to shoulder height. There was a loud bang as Carter swiveled back towards the general. A sharp pain flared up on the right side of his trunk, like getting punched in the ribs by a heavyweight boxer. Carter drew his M4 level with Koltrov and shot him twice, drilling him in the upper chest, holding his vital plumbing. The general collapsed. Carter looked round, but Zinchenko was nowhere to be seen. The rear door yawned open. He staggered forward started to give chase, then heard the small voice in the back of his head. Let her go, the voice told him. The bomb. Deal with the bomb. He stumbled towards the tactical nuke. 
It took a great effort to put one foot in front of the other. The simple act of walking left him gasping for breath. The pain in his side was excruciating, as if someone had buried a spear in his ribs. He almost lost his balance, released his grip on his M4, steadied himself against the switchgear unit, looked down at his jacket. Blood. It was covered in fresh blood. His own. Carter struggled out of his webbing, plate armor and jacket, then crooked his head to get a better look at the wounds. Two bullets had bored themselves into the side of his chest cavity, an inch or two above the lower ribs. Both entry holes were deep. He figured a bunch of shit had been sucked into the penetration site. Bits of fabric, dirt, and fuck knows what else. And he was bleeding heavily. The basic knowledge Carter had gleaned from the SAS medics course told him that he was in serious trouble. Perforation of the liver, maybe the bile duct too. Massive internal blood loss. High mortality rate. He took a field dressing from one of the pouches on his webbing, ripped open the foil packaging, applied the dressing directly to the wounds, and wrapped the bandage around his chest. Within moments, the surgical material was soaked through. The pain dialed up a notch, worse than he'd ever felt before. The invisible spear twisting, lacerating his vitals. Carter was flagging badly. Nausea surged in his throat, like a bout of travel sickness, but a million times more crippling. He thought he might retch. The effort of standing upright required every last ounce of his remaining strength. He struggled over to the general, sank to his knees beside the man, and grabbed him by the collar. Koltrov was drowning in his own blood. How do I stop the bomb? Carter demanded. Koltrov convulsed as pain racked his body. He coughed up blood and made a soft gurgling noise. Carter shook him violently. Tell me! The general parted his cracked lips slightly. Blood leaked out of the corners of his mouth. He couldn't speak. The light was going out in his right eye. Carter had seen it happen before, to mates and hostiles on the battlefield, the body recognising its own limitations, raising the white flag. Carter released his grip on the man's collar, left him on the floor, choking to death on his own blood, and staggered over to the tactical nuke. The gunfire outside had ceased, and Carter figured that his colleagues had wiped out the Russian guards. He knelt beside the bomb, inspected the fuse on top, the arming switch had been set to the engaged position. A red light glowed to indicate that the device had been armed. A line of rotating digits counted down the time to detonation in hours, minutes and seconds. Carter peered at the display. 6.23. He had less than seven minutes. Enough time. Maybe. There was no chance of getting a med evac. Not in the middle of a war zone. Any friendly chopper would be at risk of getting blown out of the sky by Russian anti-aircraft systems, and in the cold, brutal logic of Carter's mind, the threat to their lives outweighed any slim chances of preserving his own. He was bleeding out. Dying, he thought. I'm dying. He was done. Carter knew it. He was more certain of it than he had been about anything else in his life. The blood loss? The depth of penetration, the nausea rising in the back of his throat. The truth was inescapable. He had only minutes left. Fifteen, perhaps less. He had to hope that he stayed alive long enough to get the bomb out of range of the plant and any nearby civilians or military personnel. He reached for his pressel switch with a blood-stained hand, spoke into the comms. Lads, I've been hit. Repeat, I've been hit. Shit, came Logan's reply in his earpiece. Where are you, mate? Stay put and we'll come get you. We're just about done here, checking the bodies now. Leave them, Carter said. Get the fuck out of here. Head back to the Ukrainian camp. Now. What about the general? He's rigged up a bomb. I think. I think it's a man-portable nuke. He's planning to blow up the whole plant, cause a meltdown. You need to get clear of this place. But what about you? I'm hit bad. Liver's fucked. I'm not going to make it. 
Sod that, you daft cunt. We're not leaving you here. Forget it. Carter breathed in painfully and said, You're not hearing me, mate. Someone has got to take the bomb and get it as far away from this place as possible. But there has to be another way. There must be, Logan repeated, as if he was trying to persuade himself. There isn't. I can't be diffused. Now get moving. I'll deal with the bomb. Carter didn't wait for a reply. He clicked off again, dropped to his haunches, slid his arms through the straps attached to the olive green canvas case, and lifted up the bomb. It was heavier than he had expected, thirty kilograms or so, like carrying a weighted Bergen at the end of test week. He stumbled through the emergency exit, willing his tired body to move faster. Every footstep sent a fresh wave of searing pain running up his side. Carter grimaced through the agony as he rounded the building and limped towards the stolen suburban parked twenty metres away. In the distance, he caught sight of McVeigh, Webb, Logan and Popov bundling into one of the wagons. The vehicle swerved clockwise on the asphalt, nosed through the gate and took off back down the access road. A few moments later, it was lost to view. He set the nuclear device down next to the passenger side of the Suburban, leaned inside and raked his eyes over the interior. He found the key fob in one of the cup holders and offered up a silent thank you to the god he had never believed in. Carter humped the bomb into the front passenger seat. The timer dial indicated five minutes until detonation. He unclipped the toughened nylon sling from his rifle, looped it round the seat and the nuke, and pulled it tight, securing the device in place. The roads on the approach to the plant had been riddled with potholes. He didn't want the thing shaking around while he was driving away from civilization. He chucked the de-slung M4 into the back seat, somehow made it over to the driver's side door, had to rest for a moment as the sickness threatened to overwhelm him. Spots were colouring his vision as he dropped heavily behind the wheel. Every draw of breath triggered a burning pain in his chest. He fought it, pushed back against it. It's only pain, he told himself. Don't give in to it. Get moving. He started the engine, navigated out of the plant, drove at full pelt down the access road and hung a right at the road, taking him further south, closer to the Russian front line, away from the Ukrainian military camp and his SAS muckers away from the nuclear plant and the spectre of radioactive clouds sweeping over the continent. He drove hard, foot to the pedal, engine snarling with the strain. There were no other cars on the road in this area, contested territory. The Russians were pouring their scant resources into the Ukrainian fighters defending the nearby villages. They couldn't spare the manpower to establish checkpoints or set up camps along the roadheads. It became increasingly difficult to stay focused on the road. Black waves were creeping in at the edges of his vision. His eyelids felt heavy, as if they had lead weight sewn into them. Carter felt himself in danger of slipping out of consciousness. He wanted more than anything to stop the vehicle and close his eyes. No, not yet. Just a little further. After five kilometres, he reached a clearing at the edge of a wooded area. A desolate area. No buildings in sight. No farmhouses or shacks or signs of human occupation. Just fields and woods. The autumn leaves glowing in the light of the day. Beautiful, in its own way. There were worse places for a man to die. He figured this was as good a place as any. Carter stopped the car. Engaged the handbrake. The timer on the bomb ticked down to twenty seconds. The blackness spread outwards, crowding the centre of his eyesight. His mouth was sandpaper dry. The sickness faded. He could no longer feel his fingers or toes. His chest and legs were soaked in his own blood. Pints of the stuff. He felt so tired. So very tired. He stared out of the window, but he couldn't see much. Not anymore. The darkness enveloped his vision like a dark veil had been drawn over the world. The pain had numbed. He felt lightheaded. If this is death, he thought, 
It isn't so bad. There's nothing to be afraid of. Nothing at all. He closed his eyes, counted down the last seconds of his life. He thought of his brother. He thought of the dead bodies lying amid the rubble of the mayor's office. He thought about the Lion of Ukraine drowning in his own blood, and a promise he made a lifetime ago to a mother he no longer had. Five seconds. Four. Three. Two. One. Chapter 24 Credenhill Twelve Days Later A sombre mood hung over the group of mourners gathered in the sergeant's mess. The regiment NCOs and the men of D Squadron had come to pay their quiet respects to their fallen comrade, drinking beers and trading stories about Jamie Carter. A good turnout, Luke thought, all things considered. Even the CO, a man who famously disliked his brother, had put in an appearance. Jamie had been an abrasive character, never been the most popular guy in the camp, but every blade respected him for his ability to soldier. That mattered more than winning any popularity contest. They had buried him earlier that afternoon, beneath the pale grey sky, in the cemetery at the regimental church at Credenhill. The service had been simple and short. Apart from Luke, there had been no family members to mourn Jamie, no wife or children, and an outsider might have concluded that the dead man had lived a tragic and isolated existence. But they would have been mistaken. Jamie had been part of the brotherhood of the regiment. Scott Logan walked over to him and smiled awkwardly. Logan, McVeigh and Webb had been called back to Hereford after Coltrov's death, placed back on standby with the rest of A Squadron until further notice. "'How are you holding up, lad?' he asked. Luke shrugged. "'You know, I'm sorry, like... Thanks, mate.' Logan scratched the back of his neck and fumbled for the right words. "'Had some balls on him, your brother. He could be difficult, but you knew that already, I guess.' Yeah, I did. Logan hesitated. I, uh, I was the last person to speak to him before it happened. Luke looked up from his beer. What did he say? He wasn't thinking about himself. Even then, at the very end, he was only concerned about getting us to safety. Luke half smiled. That sounds like Jamie, all right. Logan stared at his drink, as if searching for inspiration in a can of Polish lager. He was a hero, he said. I want you to know that. A fucking legend of the regiment. What he did took courage. There's not many who would have done the same. I know. They lapsed into silence, sipping their beers. Luke had been called back to Hereford in the aftermath of the attack. He'd wanted to stay on in Ukraine and continue his duties, but the head shed had overruled him. They wanted to give him time to mourn his brother, they said. Get his head clear. Decompress. He had been coming up to the end of his rotation anyway. Someone else could fill his spot on the team. The day before he'd left, President Voloshin had taken him to one side and privately expressed his gratitude. He knew only a few details about the attack on Holovika, but enough to grasp the enormity of the sacrifice his brother had made and the crisis that he'd helped avert. He'd added that Luke would always have a friend in Kiev, if there was anything he could do. The President was a good man, Luke thought. Honest, true to his word, the rarest of qualities among politicians these days. He hoped the guy would stay out of harm's way. With Voloshin running the show, backed up by NATO training, support and hardware, the Ukrainians would stand a fighting chance of defeating the invaders in the long run. There had been a post-op debrief on Luke's return to camp. Hardcastle had been present, along with the OC of A Squadron, and a corporate-looking woman he didn't recognise. Hardcastle had introduced her as Ellen Kendall and said she was from Vauxhall, one of the higher-ups at six, Luke had surmised. Over coffee, they had laid bare the circumstances surrounding his brother's death. Luke had picked up bits and pieces of it from the other lads in A Squadron, but he hadn't known the full story. 
reports of the plant assault and the bomb had been ruthlessly suppressed. Likewise, the president's presence during the rocket attack on the mayor's office. They didn't want to hand the Russian to PR victory by showing how close they had come to causing a nuclear disaster or killing the president. For the same reason, Koltrov's treachery had been withheld from the media. The official line was that the general had been courageously killed leading a counterattack against Russian forces around Holovika. In recognition of his actions, he had been posthumously awarded the Hero of Ukraine, the highest title a citizen could receive. According to testimony from Logan and the other men on Koltrov's security detail, Jamie had believed that the general had emplaced a low-yield tactical nuke at the plant, but investigators from the MOD had ruled out the possibility of a man-portable nuclear device. Based on the force of the explosion and the recovery of components from the blast site, they concluded that Carter had been killed by a high-grade conventional bomb. Similar devices had been recovered by Ukrainian forces at several nuclear sites recaptured from the enemy in recent weeks. The bombs had been emplaced to demonstrate their willingness to blow up the plants. But Six believed the Kremlin had never intended to actually use them. They were there for show, they explained. Although less powerful than a nuke, the device would still have packed enough of a punch to destroy the generator room and inflict serious damage on the rest of the plant. By removing it to a safe distance from Holovika, Jamie Carter had narrowly averted the nightmare scenario of radioactive fallout. Detonation on sight would have almost certainly prompted an aggressive response from a US president desperate to flex his military muscles. Instead, the bomb had harmlessly exploded in a depopulated swathe of Ukrainian countryside. Two days after his brother's death, the news had carried stories of a rocket attack on a Russian military base near Donetsk. Hundreds of soldiers had been killed, among them a two-star general and several high-ranking FSB officers. Unofficial reports claimed that the operation had been carried out in retaliation for a Russian attack on the mayor's office in Zolodyansk. 280 civilians had died, many crushed to death in the basement. It's a crying shame Koltrov wasn't taken alive, Hardcastle had said during the debrief. We would have liked to have a conversation with him, find out the names of those other traitors inside Ukraine, but it won't make much of a difference. Kendall had explained that Six would work backwards. They would reopen investigations into potential suspects Koltrov had deliberately avoided arresting. Working on the assumption that at least some of them were Russian agents, the general had been trying to protect. It would take some time, Kendall said, but they would tease the remaining traitors out of the woodwork eventually, those who had not already fled to Russia. Any word on that press officer who was with Koltrov? Luke had asked. Zinchenko? Hardcastle had looked briefly ruffled. Afraid not. Vanished into thin air, as far as we can tell. Kendall had said, we believe she escaped across the front line to the Russians. If she was on the Ukrainian side of the battlefield, she would have been picked up a long time ago. I doubt we'll ever hear from her again. They had smiled diplomatically and fed Luke the usual spiel about not discussing his brother's death with anyone else. The facts would remain known to only a handful of people inside the regiment and at Whitehall. Officially, Jamie Carter had been accidentally killed by a stray Russian shot while on protection duties in southern Ukraine. Obviously, said Hardcastle, we can't mention your brother engaging in direct combat with Russian troops. That would be tantamount to admitting full involvement in the conflict. We'd be facing a political shitstorm. Downing Street and the White House are in full agreement on that point. Fine, Luke had said. He didn't have the desire to lock horns with the head shed over his brother's death. Then Hardcastle had leaned forward and looked him in the eye. I hope I shouldn't have to say this, Luke. You're a good soldier, so I know we can trust you. But if you spill a word of this to anyone, we'll skin you alive. Your career will be the least of your worries. I'll make damn sure of it. Am I making myself clear? Yes, boss. At the end of the meeting, Hardcastle had ordered him to go on leave for a while. 
Take a couple of weeks off, he'd said. Go on holiday, decompress, catch up with your mates, mourn your brother. But stay sharp, mind. Once you're back on duty, you'll report to me. He added with a slight flicker of a smile. We've got a job for you, Luke. Job, boss. Kendall nodded. I understand you ride a motorbike. Yes, boss. A passion of yours, is it? You might say that. Luke pulled his chin. What's the mission? We'll discuss that later. Let's just say that it's a highly confidential assignment, one that is perfectly suited for someone with your particular... interest. In the sergeant's mess, the crowd of mourners was beginning to thin out. People returned to their duties, leaving the wake as soon as it was polite to do so, as if Luke was contagious, as if grief was a virus you could catch. That was fine by him. He had a bunch of stuff to deal with anyway. His brother's cottage needed to be cleared out. Banks and credit card providers and a hundred other companies needed to be notified of his death. Some of the lads had arranged to meet up later in Hereford and drink a toast to their dead colleague, but Luke declined to join them. For once in his life, he wanted to be alone. He was finishing his beer when Logan's phone buzzed. The Liverpudlian unlocked the handset. He opened the new message, read it, tapped a link, watched, frowned. Fuck, he whispered. What? Luke asked. What is it? Logan handed him the phone. On the screen was a breaking story on the Sky News website. There was a video at the top of the article, a short clip showing the late General Koltrov standing in some sort of generator room, delivering a long and angry tirade to the screen in what sounded like Russian, wearing his trademark leather eye patch. The subtitle suggested that the general was preparing to martyr himself. Below it, a short article claimed that the video had been mysteriously uploaded to social media several hours ago. Irrefutable proof, it said, that General Kolchov had been working for the Kremlin all along. The clip had been widely circulated in Russia, the story added. The most popular video ever shared in the country. Forty million views and counting. The new hero of Russia. We hope you have enjoyed Cold Red. Keep listening for an exclusive sample from Chris's previous book, Outcast. Chapter 1 Santiago, Chile Warrant Officer Jamie Carter stood at the edge of the training range, the stiff afternoon breeze scraping through his dark hair and wished to fuck he was somewhere else. A few paces away, the last soldiers were piling out of the assault vehicles that had ferried them over from the main compound two kilometres away. There were twenty guys in total. Recruits to the Pumas, the newest addition to Chile's Special Forces Brigade. The cream of the crop, Carter had to remind himself. The country's finest warriors, though some of them didn't act much like it. Every day for the last month, Carter had been reporting to the camp shortly after dawn to oversee a training package for the soldiers. Under his guidance, the lads had spent hours on the ranges and in the lecture rooms, practising shooting drills, doing range work, studying navigation techniques and field craft, intermingled with gruelling fitness sessions. Now they were about to undertake their latest exercise. They had gathered at the edge of a wide parcel of land, the approximate size of a football field. A hundred metres away in the middle of the field, piles of car tyres had been arranged in two metre high stacks, filled with sand and laid out in the shape of a hedge maze, with doors hanging from wooden frames denoting the various entry points. Tyre Village was part of a wider military training area. Beyond the maze there were separate zones for shooting ranges, grenade and mortar practice, fields for conducting physical drills and digging hides and murder holes. Everything the soldiers needed to know to transform them into a decent SF outfit. The camp was set on the floor of an arid valley, surrounded by a patchwork of scrubland, bare hills and irrigated fields. Shreds of tissue-like cloud clung to the peaks of the distant mountains. They were eight kilometres from the nearest small town, fifty kilometres north of Santiago. More like the bloody arse end of the world. 
He had arrived several weeks ago on a two-year posting. Continuation training, they called it in the regiment. Overseas instruction for friendly SF units. Carter had another name for it. Purgatory. Send over a blade to spend a couple of years in country overseeing a programme for a bunch of sub-level operators. Train one section of soldiers for six months, get them up to scratch, pass them out, then move on to the next intake. Rinse and repeat. No one liked continuation jobs. Fact. The work was lonely and dull, and it was hard to stay motivated when you knew that most of the students would let their standards drop as soon as you left. But it was big business for the British government. Carter knew. Foreign countries were willing to pay a small fortune for the privilege of having their troops schooled by a regiment man. More importantly, the programmes had the Whitehall seal of approval. The prestige of the SAS was a useful tool for currying favour with tin pot dictators and foreign rulers. No one seemed to give a shit that the guys you were educating might end up facing you on the battlefield one day. Some years ago, a bright spark had changed the rules, so that the money from these contracts went straight back to the Hereford coffers instead of the government. Now, roughly 50% of the work done by the lads involved training packages for foreign armies. But it was still a crap assignment. Carter knew he was in Chile for purely political reasons. The British government leased a base in the south of the country, which was critical for mounting airborne operations around the Falklands if things ever kicked off there again. In return for the lease, Whitehall had agreed that 22 SAS would help to train up a new covert SF unit, drawn from the ranks of the Chilean armed forces. Another 23 months of this shite, Carter reminded himself, and all because I pissed off the wrong people. Carter shoved aside his anger as he marched over to the soldiers. They were decked out in their standard-issue camo uniforms. No one wore black kit to conduct house assaults these days, not even the lads back home in Hereford. Fifteen of the Pumas had M4 assault rifles slung over their shoulders. The others carried PGM-338 French-manufactured sniper rifles, chambered for the .338 Lapua Magnum round. All of them were equipped with leg-holstered Beretta PX4 Storm semi-automatic pistols as their sidearms. Each man also had a swept-back ballistic helmet, tactical plate carrier with front and rear armour, knee and elbow pads, plus L2 grenades and flashbangs stowed in the pouches on the front of their vests, spare mags for their primary weapon systems, tactical radio sets, throat mics and headphones. Carter wore the same uniform as the rest of the lads, but a rank above. The regiment liked its instructors to keep a low profile while they were on the job, for security reasons mainly. Better to have the trainers blend in with the regular troops, especially if Whitehall didn't want to advertise its relationship with the domestic government. Having to put on a foreign uniform every day only added to Carter's foul mood. This isn't why I joined the regiment, he thought. Dressing up in the gear of some second-rate military and lecturing a bunch of amateurs. I shouldn't be here. Carter had nothing against these lads personally. They were no different from the soldiers he trained in a bunch of other countries during his nine years in the regiment. But he knew how these units operated. Often the training programmes were a waste of everyone's time. Whether a student passed or failed had little to do with his capabilities as a warfighter and a lot to do with politics. In theory, Carter was there to develop a highly disciplined elite fighting unit. But in reality, he was more like a glorified range safety officer. It was like asking a World Cup winning coach to manage a pub team. Right, lads, he began. This is the situation. The soldiers listened keenly as he briefed them on the mission background, painting a picture for them. Carter spoke in a deliberate slow tone. Although these guys were reasonably fluent in English, some of them struggled to understand his Geordie accent. Terrorists have taken over the Japanese embassy in Santiago, he went on, waving a hand in the direction of Tyre Village. All attempts to negotiate a peaceful resolution have failed. An hour ago, the terrorists executed one of the hostages. They're now threatening to kill one civilian every hour unless their demands are met in full. The President has been updated and has authorised the use of violence to resolve the situation. This is where you come in, fellas. He paused as he glanced round the sea of faces in front of him. Carter had spent the past few weeks assessing the students and he'd swiftly identified those who were up to the job. There were a few of them, he reflected, dedicated professionals, 
Guys who trained hard and took themselves seriously in spite of the crap pay and the political bullshit. Lads who were keen to learn from their mistakes. Most of the others were willing but limited. Honest soldiers but not up to scratch as elite operators. Carter had no problem with them, as long as they put in a shift, did what they were told and didn't pull the piss. But several of them had no business being anywhere near a special forces unit. Upon his arrival, Carter had been dismayed by the poor quality of some of the recruits on the training ranges. He'd seen soldiers getting panicky when handling grenades, dropping them by accident at their feet instead of hurling them at their targets. A few students had failed to cover their flanks or race too far ahead of their colleagues during fire and movement drills. Lectures on navigation and map reading had fallen flat. Some of their weapon handling skills were slack. In the regiment, you'd weed out the bad apples early on in the selection process. Time wasters didn't last long. Here, Carter had no choice but to grit his teeth and get on with it. He said, Snipers have been observing the stronghold for the past 24 hours. We know that there are 16 embassy staff and civilians being held hostage inside, and eight X-rays. They have to be dealt with now to prevent any further loss of life. He looked towards the unit commander. Captain Carlos Medell was a single bloke in his early 30s, tall and lean with a chin so prominent you could hang a coat from it. He was a fundamentally decent soldier, who, rather unusually, appeared to have earned his rank on merit. He was diplomatic, disliked small talk and bluster. He was also one of the few friends Carter had made since he'd arrived in Chile. They'd often enjoyed a few jars in one of the bars in Santiago, shooting the breeze. Captain, I want you to plan a multi-entry assault, Carter said. You've got 30 minutes then I want you to prosecute an attack on the stronghold. Understood? Yes, Jamie, Medell said. No problem. I should lead the main assault group, Captain, one of the soldiers cut in. Carter slanted his gaze towards the guy who'd spoken. Fabian Vargas, one of the bad apples, a doughy-faced fat kid in his early twenties. Carter had taken one look at the guy and wondered how the hell he had managed to get selected for SF duty. When he put the question to Medell, the captain had merely shaken his head and muttered something about the kid's father, a general who had recently been appointed as the president's chief of staff. Carter had disliked Vargas on first sight, and nothing he'd seen since had changed his opinion. The previous day, they had been practicing a man-down drill, a straightforward exercise. A couple of guys run over to a soldier pretending to be wounded, lift him up and carry him to safety while their colleagues put down suppressive fire to cover them. Vargas had even managed to cock that one up, dropping the injured lad as they legged it from the kill zone. The guy was a walking disaster. We hope you have enjoyed listening to Cold Red, written by Chris Ryan and read by Elliot Fitzpatrick. Cold Red is published by Zaffer, an imprint of Bonnier Books UK. Text copyright 2023 by Chris Ryan. Production copyright 2023 by Bonnier Books UK.